Today we're headed to Alaska on board the Discovery Princess round trip from Seattle, Washington, and we're taking you with us. We'll make our way from Texas to Seattle, go through the embarkation process, get on board the Discovery Princess at the Port of Seattle, and sail away toward Ketchikan, our first port of call. But before we can do anything else, we have to get to Seattle. Our early morning flight on Alaska Airlines will take us from Austin, Texas to Seattle, Washington in a little over four hours. Flight over the plains of West Texas was a little bumpy at first, but after a cup of coffee it smoothed out, breakfast was served, and the flight over the rest of the Texas Panhandle was much smoother. The Rocky Mountains were beautiful on a morning when they had recently seen their first snowfall. Here we get a great view of Pikes Peak and the surrounding Front Range. And then as the flight continued, we were treated to more great views as we flew over the 14,000 foot peaks of the Continental Divide and eventually into the northwest corner of Utah, southwestern Wyoming, and Idaho. These are some great views of the red canyons of the Flaming Gorge National Recreation Area, located in northwestern Utah and southeastern Wyoming. Soon after entering Washington, we begin our approach into Seattle with some nice views of the city and the Port of Seattle. We flew Alaska Airlines from Austin to Seattle and were able to secure first class seats round trip for a very reasonable rate of a little over $700 by watching Google flights, being flexible about flight times, and buying tickets six months in advance. Alaska is the dominant airline out of Seattle Tacoma Airport and offers the best deals in general. Since our flight was long, we flew into Seattle on Saturday, the day before embarking on our cruise, and flying the day before allowed us for any potential airport or airline delays. In addition, it allowed us to be flexible with times for the best ticket prices. We booked a hotel that was about 30 minutes from the airport, so we took an Uber to the hotel, allowing us to see some of the sights of Seattle and the downtown skyline along the way. Near our hotel is an excellent Indian and Mediterranean food restaurant called the Saffron Grill, where we had dinner before turning in for the diet in anticipation of heading to the Port of Seattle the next morning. We were able to have breakfast at the hotel the next morning before checking out around 10.30 and heading to the Smith Cove Cruise Terminal at Pier 91 to board the Discovery Princess for our cruise to Alaska. The 20-minute drive to the port afforded many great views of Seattle and the port itself, but the highlight was the first view of the Discovery Princess itself and the sheer size of this 1,100-foot ship. The embarkation process at the terminal is straightforward, but takes a little time. There are multiple traffic lanes for drop-off by rideshares, taxis, and shuttles, servicing multiple cruise lines. Today, a Holland America cruise was departing along with our Princess cruise. 
Transporters with cards for each cruise line are available to take bags that you aren't carrying on, and you will be directed to a line depending on whether you already have completed travel documentation or not. After passing through security similar to airports, you will be directed to boarding lanes and soon headed up the ramp and onto the ship. Entry onto the Discovery Princess is at the upper level of the Piazza. It is an impressive first view inside the ship, with the Piazza's three levels, glass elevators, and sweeping staircases. Our cabins were ready by one, and since sail away was not until four, we completed watching our safety video, checked into our muster station, put our things in the cabin and headed up to the pool deck on deck 16 for drinks, a quick bite to eat, and views of the port in Seattle. In addition, we experienced the glass walkways on deck 16 that allow you to look down 16 decks to the ocean below. Deck 16 was also a good place to view the departure of the Holland America ship that shared our embarkation terminal on this day. It departed an hour before us. As 4 p.m. approached, we decided to head back to our cabin to watch our own departure from the balcony. Right on time, we were moving and were afforded some final views of the now empty terminal area and the port of Seattle. Soon we were sailing north in Puget Sound before turning westward toward the Pacific Ocean with the Olympic Mountains in the distance as a backdrop. We had reservations at the Crown Grill, a specialty steak and seafood restaurant on board that we had made using the Princess app before boarding. And after a quick look around our room, we were headed to deck seven for dinner. Entertainment was already in full swing to welcome guests aboard as we headed toward the Crown Grill to the aft of the ship on the promenade deck. From the appetizers to the main course, wine, and desserts, dinner at the Crown Grill was very good and a great way to begin our cruise. After dinner, we spent some time at the casino and decided to check out the theater where we planned to see one of the Princess production shows the following night. The next day, Monday, was a sea day, and the plan was to spend the day getting a massage at the spa and getting better acquainted with the ship and what it had to offer. Mother Nature, however, had other ideas. As the Pacific Ocean greeted us with a storm front, 50 mile an hour winds and 15 foot waves starting on Sunday night and continuing until Monday afternoon. I didn't take any video during the day on Monday due to the rough seas, but by evening the ocean had settled and we headed to the theater to see rock opera. Rock opera is a high quality production show with a talented cast, live band, colorful costumes, and excellent sound and lighting. It is definitely worth the time spent while on board the ship. Video is not allowed in the show, but still pictures are. So enjoy these scenes from the show.
Tomorrow, we will arrive in Ketchikan, Alaska. The ship arrived at an overcast and rainy Ketchikan at 7 a.m. Even with the low-lying clouds, the beauty of the Tongass Narrows, the port of Ketchikan, and the surrounding area were still evident from the cabin balcony. By the time we were dressed and ready, the ship was ready for passengers to disembark and we headed through the piazza to the exit ramp on deck five to begin our exploration of Ketchikan. It was raining as we exited the Discovery, but we still got our first real close-up view of this giant passenger ship we were cruising on, as it sat tied up at berth four. Berth 4 in Ketchikan is located about a half a mile from the main waterfront at berths 1 and 2. But the walk along the boardwalk in Water Street and eventually onto Front Street is interesting even in the rain. There are a number of shops and restaurants in the area and with much of the day to explore there is plenty of time to check them out before returning to the ship. While walking along Front Street, I spotted a coffee shop and bakery across the street. So I had to cross over to give it a try. Alaska Coffee was a busy place, and I was able to satisfy my morning need for a latte and a ham, egg, and cheese breakfast bagel before continuing on to the main waterfront. After a short walk of a little over a block, we reached Mission Street and Berth 2, which this morning was the home to the 960-passenger Viking Orion. Berth 2 is also home to The Rock, a bronze sculpture which represents a vision of early Alaskan pioneers. Mission Street is home to the well-known Ketchikan sign that we will get a better look at later upon our return to the ship. Walking along the cruise ship docks for another block brings you to Mill Street and a number of retail shops and the Alaska King Crab Company. And then onto the boardwalk and its shops overlooking the docks where this morning the 2,100 plus passenger Carnival Miracle is docked.
Just around the corner are more shops and restaurants and the great Alaskan lumberjack show on days when the weather is a little more cooperative. Continuing this way leads past the harbor and eventually to the bridge over Ketchikan Creek that leads to historic Creek Street. I stopped here to take a few shots of Creek Street and Ketchikan Creek, for which it was named, before crossing the bridge over the creek to the Creek Street Boardwalk. Creek Street has a checkered past in that it was once the red light district in the pioneer days, but today it has been preserved as a historic district with its boardwalk built over the creek on wooden pilings and is filled with shops, restaurants, and the Dolly House Museum. At certain times of the year, it is also a great place to view the salmon run as they make their way up Ketchikan Creek. At the north end of the Creek Street Boardwalk is a pedestrian bridge over Ketchikan Creek and another entrance exit to Creek Street. From here you can see the tram that goes up from Creek Street to the lobby of the Cape Fox Lodge. Also located on this entrance side of the creek is Whale Park. After leaving Creek Street, I headed down Mission Street back in the direction of the waterfront and the cruise ship docks. There are more retail shops and restaurants in this area, along with St. John's Episcopal Church.
Located near Front Street on Mission Street is the previously mentioned Ketchikan sign, denoting it as Alaska's first city and proclaiming Ketchikan as the salmon capital of the world. Mission Street ends at berth two of the cruise ship docks, where we were previously. Here you will find stands for tours, food, and other things, like this lady who is selling tours for catchatour.com. Welcome to Alaska. We do trolley tours of the island. 90 minutes, we leave every 30 minutes. We show you the highlights of Ketchikan, we show you our local wildlife, show you a good time, take you out on our trolley, tell you some stories, and bring you back to your ship. Now I have no affiliation with Catch a Tour, but just wanted to give a quick shout out to this woman who seemed to be working hard in the rain. I decided to walk down the dock one more time before beginning my walk back to the ship. I headed back to the ship down Front Street, but decided to take the tunnel this time to get at least a few minutes reprieve from the rain. Our ship came into view on the other end, and the walk from here was not too long. Just past the tunnel, I found this shot interesting in showing the height of the Discovery Princess as it stood visible above the roof of this building. Before heading back through security to reboard the ship, I took a couple of minutes to admire the largest ship in the Princess fleet, at least until February of 2024, when the Sun Princess at 20% larger is set to debut. Launched in 2022, Discovery is three times the size of Titanic carrying 3,660 passengers and 1,346 crew members on its 19 decks. Let's get back on board. As we boarded and headed back through the piazza, some of the ship's bartenders were showing off their drink mixing skills to an interactive audience. I grabbed a snack and something to drink, watched for a while, and then headed back to the cabin to watch our sail away from Ketchikan from our balcony. And of course, by the time we were back aboard the ship and it was time to sail away, the rain had stopped. At least this made for a beautiful departure headed northward in the inside passage. An interesting note, 
The Ketchikan Airport is located north of Ketchikan, on an island on the opposite side of the channel from Ketchikan. It has commercial airline service, but passengers need to take a ferry across the channel to reach the airport from Ketchikan. During our ship's transit through this area, our timing allowed us to observe and video an Alaska Airline flight taking off from the airport. After watching us sail northward for a few more minutes, we headed to an excellent dinner in the Skagway main dining room, highlighted by some very impressive desserts. By the time we were finished with dinner, the clouds had cleared, leaving us to observe an absolutely amazing sunset from the ship's balcony before heading back to the piazza. Check it out. After dinner, entertainment was in full swing in the piazza, with the combined entertainers from the ship joining together to play international music from their various countries. It was very popular, as you can see from these scenes.
After they concluded, the piazza settled into its normal nightly entertainment, and people dispersed to various parts of the ship for the evening. After listening to some music and playing in the casino for a while, I headed back to the room to settle in for the night. We were awakened by the captain at a little after 1 a.m. to inform us of some exciting news. We have northern lights. I found the aurora borealis almost impossible to video, and in fact got the best videos of the movement of the lights from the bridge camera view on the television, but it didn't show the colors. Fortunately, a fellow passenger with a digital SLR camera was able to capture a nice shot and was kind enough to share it with us. We left Ketchikan yesterday afternoon at 4 p.m. and have been sailing northward in the inside passage toward Juneau throughout the night. This morning we're taking a detour along the way to take a scenic cruise up Endicott Arm to Dawes Glacier. We entered Endicott Arm early in the morning before the sun had risen over the surrounding mountains. The water in Endicott Arm was glassy smooth and the motion of the ship was barely noticeable. The surrounding mountains were backlit by the colors of the coming sunrise. Indicott Arm is a 30 mile long fjord formed by Dawes Glacier which terminates at the end of the arm. As soon as we pass the islands marking the beginning of the arm, we begin to see floating pieces of glacial ice that had calved off the Dawes Glacier still many miles away. There is plenty to see as the ship makes its way along the fjord. There are many side inlets and waterfalls as the arm continues to narrow and the surrounding mountains get taller. As we continued to see chunks of glacial ice float by, the sky began to brighten as the sun began to rise and we began to get glimpses of the glacier high in the mountains.
Let's watch as the sun rises over Endicott Arm. The blue color of the glacial ice, which was growing larger, is caused by the density of the ice as a result of the immense pressure of the weight of thousands of feet of ice. Because of this, the red waves are absorbed and only the blue rays are reflected. We passed more waterfalls and the water became increasingly turquoise blue as a result of the glacial silt suspended in the water. And then the face of the glacier made its first appearance. Dahl's Glacier is a tidewater glacier with a face that is hundreds of feet tall and a half mile across. Let's take a look at this glacier as we approach it on the Discovery Princess. As we got near the glacier, the ship used its side thrusters and pivoted in place, giving us a perfect broadside view of the glacier's face. After spending time photographing and admiring the glacier, we begin our trip back to the entrance of Endicott Arm and the Inside Passage. Interestingly, due to our view being of the opposite side of the fjord and the later morning light, the cruise westward was like a different trip and just as picturesque.
As the islands marking the entrance to Endicott Arm appeared, we knew this part of the cruise was coming to a close. As we left the fjord, we turned northward toward Juno, where we would arrive in a few hours. As we sailed north toward Juno, we began to encounter more traffic on the water in the form of fishing vessels, and eventually, we began to see houses along the shore. Juno is located on the Gastineau Channel and on the mainland across the channel from Douglas Island. Douglas Island is the home to the communities of Douglas and West Juno, and it's where many of the people of Juno live. It is connected to the mainland and Juno by Douglas Bridge. Since our cabin was on the port side of the ship, we were looking at Douglas Island as we sailed into the port in downtown Juneau. As you can see in these shots, it is another cloudy and rainy day in southeast Alaska as we approach Juneau. As the ship turned in toward the dock, we began to get a better view of downtown Juneau where our ship would dock. This view from the bridge cam shows our ship docking right in the heart of downtown Juneau. After docking at around 1.30, the process of securing the ship and preparing it for disembarkation took a few minutes, and by 2, the announcement came that we could get off the ship and out into the rainy streets of Juneau. Despite the fact that Juneau is the state capital, the population is around 32,000, making it a very walkable city, with many shops and restaurants located within easy walking distance of the downtown cruise ship dock. Also located in this area is the Mount Roberts Tram, which takes visitors to the top of Mount Roberts for spectacular views of Juneau, Douglas Island, and the Gastineau Channel. This was a ride that I'd taken on a previous trip to Juneau a number of years ago and was looking forward to on this trip. Unfortunately, with the rainy and foggy weather on this day, 
the views would have been completely obscured. So we spent our time off the ship wandering the streets of Juneau. Here we popped into a shop and watched as this guy made fudge. And of course, there was coffee. Heading back to the ship, we passed the Alaska Heritage Institute and some of its display of totem poles. The streets of Juneau are well kept, with planters, decorative lamp posts, and hanging flower baskets evident along the streets. It was still raining as we returned to the ship, and it was evident that many passengers were still off the ship, even in the rain. There were also a number of excursions that passengers had taken, particularly to Mendenhall Glacier that was very popular, and which was not within walking distance of the ship. I had seen Mendenhall on a couple of previous visits to Juneau, and opted to not take this excursion, even though it is definitely worth your time if you haven't seen it. I checked out a couple of onboard specialty dining venues, including the Bistro Sur Le Maire shown here, before heading to main dining for dinner before our nighttime sail away. Our Juno sail away was after dark, and we got some great views of the lights of Juno and Douglas before we sailed away northward towards Skagway, our next port of call the following morning. The Discovery arrived in Skagway at 7 a.m., and since we had tickets for the White Pass and Yukon Railway at noon, 
I got up to explore the town in time to return to the ship for a bite to eat before our noon excursion. We were docked at the railroad dock, and from here, it is a 10 to 15 minute walk into town. There's also a shuttle service from the docks to various points in town for a nominal cost, which as of this video was $2 one way or $5 for the entire day. I chose to take the scenic walk into town even though it was another rainy southeastern Alaska day. It is an easy walk and there are a couple of interesting restaurants along the way that I think I would like to try on a different day and schedule. Our dock is called the Railroad Dock because the White Pass and Yukon Railroad has a siding here that picks up cruise passengers directly, as we will see on our excursion later in the day. Headed into town, we cross the tracks and can see another Yukon Railroad train loading at the station in town. As we near the main part of town, we pass the parking area and arrive at the station for the White Pass and Yukon Railroad. Since we won't be leaving from this station later, let's step inside and have a look around. Inside is a nice souvenir slash gift shop with White Pass and Yukon branded items and railroad memorabilia, as well as a ticketing counter and a waiting area. Boarding for the 9 a.m. train was taking place as I was visiting the station. It was not very busy on this late September morning, but in the summer, this place is swarming with people and extremely busy. Here we see one of the tour buses from the popular Skagway Alaska Streetcar Tour, a 90 minute tour around Skagway and its historical sites. Let's head up the wooden sidewalks of Broadway. The Red Onion Saloon was built in 1897 during the height of the gold rush and was operated as a brothel in those days. Today, though, it is a favorite restaurant and saloon among visitors to Skagway. The AB or Arctic Brotherhood building was home to the Arctic Brotherhood in 1899, but today is the Skagway Convention and Visitors Bureau. The facade is completely covered with almost 9,000 pieces of driftwood. The Golden North Hotel is the oldest operating hotel in Alaska. It has 32 rooms and was built in 1898 and brought up to standards in 1997. It is also home to several retail shops. Let's continue up Broadway.
The Pantheon and Red Front Building, like many in Skagway, are historic buildings built during the gold rush and currently operated by the National Park Service, who rents them out to private businesses. The Days of 98 show is a show that is performed multiple times daily, April through September, that depicts life in Skagway in 1898 under the rule of notorious outlaw Soapy Smith. It is a popular excursion for cruisers and visitors alike. Also located here on Broadway is the Skagway Post Office. As the rain increases, we'll cross the street here and head back toward the ship.
There are a number of side streets and a couple more streets with shops and restaurants to explore when the weather is nice. But today we're going to head back to the ship to get ready for our noon train ride to White Pass. We boarded the train at the siding conveniently located at the end of the cruise ship dock. After being directed to a car, we chose seats and settled in. Soon we were underway and passing along the walkway into town that I had used earlier in the day. It was not long before we were passing through the edge of Skagway and headed out of town on our way to White Pass. During the early part of the trip, we passed through forests and across streams as we slowly climbed out of the valley from Skagway. As you can see, it was still raining as we climbed into the mountains. There was also a narrator on board to give us insight into the background and history of the area and the railroad. The White Pass, which started in Skagway, and there was the Chilkoot Trail, which started in Dye, nine miles west of Skagway. Some chose the Chilkoot Trail and others chose the White Pass Trail. They believed it would be easier by having pack animals carry their supplies. Each car had open air platforms at the end where we were allowed to take photos and videos along the way. The platform was covered, but it was still a wet proposition on this rainy day. As you probably heard the narrator say, here is a view of Bridal Vale Falls as seen across the valley and through the trees. As the train climbed higher and higher, our views of the valley looking down towards Skagway became more and more spectacular and the trees more sparse. Sorry. 
Even on this rainy and foggy day, the views were nothing short of breathtaking. At this point, we could see the railroad where we were earlier below and the highway into Skagway from Canada across the valley. The views down the valley and the clouds and scenery below looked more like the aerial views you would see from an airplane than that from a train. Near the top of the pass, we passed over a trestle and through a tunnel. Here through the raindrops on the window, we see one of the original trestles on the railroad that is no longer in use. At this point, we have reached the tree line and are approaching the Canadian border. Here you can see parts of the original White Pass Trail. We crossed the border into Canada, but since we're not getting off the train, we don't have to go through customs and immigration. Now, when I rode the White Pass in Yukon 25 years ago, we stopped just past the border, uncoupled the engine and moved it to the other end of the train, and flipped the seats for the trip back down the mountain. Since that time, this loop has been added that allows the train to turn around and head back down the mountain without uncoupling. The views on the trip back down the mountain were on the opposite side of the train, so I didn't take much video on the trip down. As we started back down the mountain, I caught this shot of the small cabin at the Canada-US border, although the flags are not visible due to the window. By 3 p.m., we were back on board the ship. These shots are from my cabin balcony looking at the Skagway dock. The area where you see construction was the site of a rock slide that temporarily closed the dock earlier in the year and was undergoing mitigation and reinforcement during our visit. This balcony view of the Lynn Canal is mostly blocked by the fog bank. The ship departed Skagway at 5 p.m. to begin the 1,000-mile-plus trip back to Victoria, British Columbia over the next 48 hours or so. We headed to dining and were seated near a window to observe our sail down the Lynn Canal. Just before dark, we were able to observe the iconic Eldred Rock Lighthouse. And then it was on to shipboard nightlife where it was off to a show and then some time in the Creener's Lounge.
Today is a sea day on our Alaska cruise, and we're going to explore the Discovery Prentice and see what it's like on board this giant ship. Now, where to go first? It's a big ship, but a number of decks are filled with cabins, so we won't visit those. Let's head up to the top, to the Lido deck, deck 16. Deck 16 is predominantly pools and the buffet, with a few cabins thrown in. The closest elevator bank to our room, which is toward the front of the ship, brings us out on the Lido deck near Slice Pizzeria. Slice offers pizza by the slice. It is included with the cruise fare. Also located at the front of the pool area on deck 16 is the Mix Cocktail Bar. In the corner is the Salty Dog Grill, where you can pick up a burger and fries or specialty hot dogs while out by the pool. The pool section of the Lido deck is an open air deck with lots of protected areas for seating out of the wind and weather. There are two main pools and numerous hot tubs here with lots of seating with pool or sea views. Our cruise was in late September and the weather was cool, generally in the 50s. In addition, we were out in the open Pacific on this sea day, so the pools were not used much this trip. Here we see three of the many hot tubs and showers scattered around the deck and the view from them. Let's take the stairs up one deck to the sun deck, where we can get a great overhead view of the Lido deck pools, as well as some great ocean views. There are even more hot tubs on this deck. There was always something showing on the big screen that was towering over the pools. The balcony ahead is toward the front of the ship and is a private balcony for one of the two bedroom sky suites, each with over 1,500 square feet of floor space. Back on the Lido deck toward the back of the pool area, under the protected overhang is the Sea Walk, a glass walkway that allows you to look down 16 decks to the ocean below. There's one on each side of the ship. Located at the back of the pool area near the buffet entrance is the Sea View Bar. A 
Another fun place in the corner by the buffet entrance is Swirls, a place to grab a soft serve ice cream cone whenever you want it. What a deal. Let's head into the enormous World Fresh Marketplace, Discovery Princess version of the Cruise Buffet. This buffet features section after section of food choices and seating on each side of the ship. You will also find sections like this one that are closed as the staff prepares to serve the next meal of the day. It can get a bit crowded on a sea day, but if you're patient, you can snag a table like this one with a great ocean view. As we continue toward the back of the ship, we actually come to the end of the buffet and exit through a bank of elevators into a quiet area of seating with great views, the Wakeview bar, and a pool. As you can see, the ocean was a bit rough for the Wakeview pool on this day. Notably, even though the water in the pool was being tossed about quite a bit, the motion of the ship was still hardly noticeable. As the Wakeview name implies, this is a great place for views from the back of the ship. Let's head back through the buffet to the pool area. I really enjoyed these seating areas and the covered areas around the pool. On the following day, I just sat under the overhang, had some pizza and a margarita, and watched a football game on the giant screen.
Before leaving the Lido, I'll head back up one deck to get a peek at the fitness center. This view is only a tiny part of the large fitness center. Also up here is the adult-only retreat pool and bar. Let's head back down to Deck 7, the promenade deck, to the Princess Theater. The theater is located at the front of the ship, and the Deck 7 entrance is the upper level. Outside of the theater on this deck is the Shops of Princess shopping area. On the port side of the ship overlooking the piazza below is the Bistro Sur La Mer, soon to be the catch by Rudy. And in the center is Bellini's Bar. We'll walk through the elevator bank to the port side of the ship and continue walking toward the back. It is interesting to note that at each elevator you will find a sign indicating the deck where places aboard the ship can be found. The view from deck 7 at the rear of the piazza is one of the best views of the piazza and the surrounding area. Moving on toward the back of the ship, we come to the medallion class desk, where passengers can get help with the medallion that gives you access to your room and all the shipboard venues. Here you can also purchase accessories for your medallion, such as our wristband. On the right is the Princess Live Cafe, followed by the Princess Live Venue. The cafe serves beer, wine, cocktails, and espresso coffee drinks. The venue hosts guest lectures, art shows, games, and trivia throughout the cruise. Just beyond Princess Live is the Crown Bar and Crown Grill, a specialty dining steakhouse on board the Discovery Princess. We ate here our first night on board and found it very enjoyable. Check out my Heading to Alaska video to see more. And finally at the rear of Deck 7 is the Vista Lounge Entertainment Venue. As we walked back forward, I noticed that Princess Live was hosting an art auction on this day. Moving forward on the starboard side of Deck 7, we come to Gigi's Pizzeria, an Italian-style pizzeria serving Neapolitan-style freshly cooked individual pizzas.
Heading down the stairs to deck six, the Fiesta deck brings us to the Princess Casino. This Vegas-style casino features your favorite slot machines and table games and is available for play when the ship is not in port. After walking through the casino, we find the lower theater entrance up front on the Fiesta deck. Next to the casino on the ship's sports side is the Take 5 Lounge. Take 5 offers live jazz music each evening. This is one of the venues that often goes unnoticed since it is tucked away beside the casino. It is also a great place during the day to relax by a window and just watch the ocean go by. Moving back toward the Piazza area on deck six, there's another part of the shops of Princess along with the ship's photo shop and an art gallery. In the center overlooking the Piazza is the Ocean Terrace Sushi Bar. Behind the piazza on deck six is the Skagway main dining room. It was one of three main dining rooms on the ship. And finally on deck six headed forward from the Skagway dining room on the starboard side is the Crooners bar. Let's head downstairs to deck five, the plaza deck, and over to the International Cafe. The International Cafe is open 24 seven and serves sandwiches, soups, quiche, tiny pies, tempting desserts, and a full menu of drinks and coffees. It is located in the hub of the piazza and is popular at all times of the day and night. Located next to the International Cafe is the Good Spirits at Sea Bar. Behind the piazza on deck five is the Juno Dining Room, the second of the main dining rooms. Located back forward on deck five on the starboard side of the ship is the Salty Dog Gastropub. Finally, on the starboard side of the ship, forward of the Salty Dog, is Sabatini's, a specialty Italian dining venue. It is located just off of the piazza and across from guest services.
At the front of the ship on Deck 5 is the Lotus Spa, offering all types of spa services for women and men. One more place we need to look at is the third main dining room, Ketchikan Dining. This one is located at the rear of the ship on Deck 6, but is accessible only from the rear elevators and stairs from floors above. As I head back to my room on Deck 10, Caribe Deck, I thought I would give you a look at the hallways. These hallways are long. By the time I get to my door, it is unlocked by the medallion that I'm wearing. Before we end this video, let's take a look at my room on the Discovery Princess. This room is a standard balcony room. It is a decent sized room with beds and a nice desk area where the room steward leaves schedules, excursion tickets, etc. each day. There is an in-room refrigerator and a decent sized flat screen TV. The bathroom is pretty standard and on the smaller size with a sink, toilet, and a good sized shower. Finally, there's an area to hang clothes along with a small closet with a safe. Our cruise is quickly coming to an end. Friday night was the second and final formal night after a day at sea. We start with a dinner staff parade as they present the baked Alaska during formal night in the main dining room. Baked Alaska was definitely not the only dessert. I took pictures of a few more. These desserts were often the highlights of meals and dining. Friday night in the Princess Theater was the presentation of the production show Spotlight Bar. This innovative show depicts an evening at the vibrant Spotlight Bar where people get together and share stories through music and song. This was a good show with talented musicians and singers. As was the case with rock opera, the other production show, video was not allowed, so I got a few photos.
Saturday was another sea day as we wouldn't arrive in Victoria, British Columbia until 7 p.m. But we were soon sailing within sight of the beautiful British Columbia coast and eventually into the Strait of San Juan de Fuca. The afternoon was pretty relaxed and I found myself relaxing by the pool with pizza and a margarita watching football on the giant screen. So Saturday afternoon found the Princess Theater presenting a variety theater matinee featuring Tricia Kelly, vocal impressionist who had performed in the theater earlier in the week, and Liam Stewart, featured performer in the Crooner's Lounge for the week. Our arrival into Victoria was in the late afternoon around sunset, and it is a beautiful arrival. Let's watch from our cabin balcony. Many people, including me, did not get off the ship in Victoria. Due to being in port for only a few hours, the need to take a shuttle into town and the fact that it was at night. There was plenty of activity on board, however, for those staying on the ship. I headed up to the very top of the ship, to a part of the ship I didn't show you in the previous ship tour video, to see if I could get some nighttime shots of Victoria, British Columbia. This area is the walking, jogging track and the basketball and pickleball courts on the ship. There were two other cruise ships in port beside us, the Holland America Westerdam and the Norwegian Encore. All the way on deck 19 Vista is the putting green that I just discovered on this last night of the cruise. Let's head along the jogging track and see what views we can discover. Finally, here's what I was looking for, a nice view of the skyline of Victoria, British Columbia at night. And then it was over. We were back at Seattle where we spent the night before heading back to the airport to board our Alaska Airlines flight back to Austin, Texas. The departure out of Seattle was very scenic. at least until we were in the clouds. But as we headed south and east, the clouds began to clear and we were afforded much better views of the train below. The views of the Great Salt Lake, Salt Lake City, and the Wasatch Mountains were great this afternoon.
We had meal service as we watched the views of the Rockies in Colorado and New Mexico go by below. Here we can see the town of Red River, New Mexico, a popular tourist and ski town. After about three hours, we were over the plains of Texas and caught this view of the city of Lubbock. Soon we were passing over the lakes of the Texas Hill Country and beginning our approach into Austin, Texas. I'll leave you to watch our landing in Austin and the end of our Alaska trip. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, would you give us a thumbs up, share it, and leave us a comment to let us know what you think? We invite you to join us on our website at findushere.com, as well as on Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon. And be sure to check out this video next for more travel fun. And don't forget to subscribe. Your subscriptions are always greatly appreciated. Thank you.